We are very happy to be joined here by our good friend Prasant R, who's a journalist with the fantastic People's Dispatch and also with News Click, the, in my view, the top media source, media house, if you will, in all of India. Mm -hmm. Prasant, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, looking at this conflict, I mean, it feels that India has honestly been one of the main countries that has been, it seems, kind of caught in a bind here. And I was wondering if you could help us understand this a bit, because, of course, I think many people know that Prime Minister Modi is, you know, hand in glove with the United States and has been very much part of the U.S. Uh, attempt to contain China and, and a number of other fronts. But here we saw India seeming, you know, it's described as a pro-Russian position, but at least not lockstep with the United States. I, I mean, what does this really account for? How do we understand this, the, the shifting sands here? Right. Thank you so much, Eugene, for that question. Very important because I think India is one of the countries whose position has really not been understood so much, as Rania said, one of those countries not considered so much a part of the international community. A couple of things to sort of remember. I'm sorry to be the person who says we need to go back to history. But in the 50s and the 60s, India did have this policy called non-alignment, where it took this decision to not be part of the US-led bloc or the Soviet-led bloc. India did have very good relations with the Soviet Union, which were very important in building infrastructure and building defense ties. Soviet Union, long-time partner of India. But from the 90s onwards, there was a shift where India goes much, grows much more closer to the US position in a lot of issues. And this increased you know, greater bilateral ties, greater economic ties. There was a nuclear deal which we signed in 2008, which has caused a lot of controversy. But throughout all this period, while India's, India has become closer to Israel, for instance, while India's you know, political position has shifted, there's still been a very strong economic relationship with Russia. And that's, I think, one of the key things to sort of remember the fact that despite all these strategic moves, India is now a part of the Quad, you know, along with Japan and Australia, for instance. And, uh, you know, India has been sort of being positioned as a key player in the Indo-Pacific strategy or what is being called the Indo-Pacific strategy. The United States very eager to have India as a key partner in what when it tries to encircle China, for instance. But during all this, it's important to note that, like I said, there's a very strong economic relationship with Russia. And... One of these things is the fact that <clears throat> there is a, in terms of defense equipment, for instance, I think around 60% of India's defense uh, imports equipment comes from Russia. That's a big number. And if you look, for instance, at the fact that uh, economic ties, for instance, we have oil, of course, which is a big issue, but also fertilizers. A lot of people talk about oil, but when you look at Russia's contribution to India's economy, the role of fertilizers is uh, often you know, not considered that seriously, but it's very massive. And India does not want to sort of face an economic crisis right now. That's the last thing this government wants. So uh, what this has led to basically is this kind of nuanced position, so to speak, where in various votes, for instance, it has refused to take a stance. We know about the vote in the UN General Assembly, but there have been other procedural votes in the Security Council, one in the IAEA also, where it has refused to condemn the Russian position. So uh, right now, India playing a very delicate uh, maneuvering game. On the one hand, it has its largest strategic interests which are very much more closely tied to the United States. On the other hand, there are immediate geopolitical and economic interests which are closely tied to Russia. So uh, the last time India was given this choice was, or so-called choice, was with Iran, where India was a major importer of Iranian oil. And the United States basically said that, you know, I, I either cut off, those, cut off those imports or you're going to come under the sanctions regime and India complied. This time uh, it has refused to do so. In fact, there have been further oil purchases since the war began. And there is a lot of speculation about a major deal that is going to be struck with Russia right now. So that's where we are at as far as the relations are concerned. It's so interesting because that really is, I think, emblematic of what so many countries, I think, in the global south are trying to balance right now, even if they're very close allies with the U.S. Because it demonstrates that Russia is a global power in some way. And it does speak to some, you know, a theme that we've been talking about a lot on Breakthrough News in various ways, and that's the issue of like rising multipolarity. And I'm curious if you know you where China fits in here, because of course India and China have had a bit of a tense relationship recently. Um, but you know, taking a stand like this kind of puts China maybe not in the same position as, or uh, India maybe not in the same position as China, but it's not in the U.S. orbit on this. Do you think that? Exactly this might bring China and India maybe closer together, or I don't know, maybe it's the opposite. Is there a risk of war between them, given what we've seen taking place the last couple of years? 
Right. Actually, the recent crisis was uh, kind of noteworthy because it is one of those issues where India, Pakistan and China all took a very similar position and a lot of people pointed out that, you know, the irony of that, so to speak. But uh, actually, there's been a, there's going to be a lot of diplomacy in the coming uh, week or two, which is very interesting because on the one hand, uh, this week we have the Japanese Prime Minister visiting uh, New Delhi. I think, I believe on Monday or something, the Australian Prime Minister and Narendra Modi are having a summit meeting via teleconference. Victoria Newland, incidentally, is coming to uh, Delhi next week as well. <laughs> Good question. But yeah, uh, amid all this, we also have Wang Yi, the Prime Minister of China. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, if, if you start making counts like that, that's a different question. But yes, in between all this, we also have Wang, the Chinese foreign minister, coming to India as well towards the end of the month. Uh, in the last, last few days, it has been confirmed. And now, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, de- development that has taken place because, uh, you know, like you said, since 2020, especially things have been very tense uh, with China. There have been talks. I mean, there's been, you know, there have been a couple of military. Uh, incidents as well. There have been talks. They're not really worked out. So at this point, the opposition, for instance, has been attacking the government on this. So at this point of time, Wang Yi coming is a very interesting move because it does signal the possibility of, you know, a much talks at a much higher level. And it's also important to note that Afghanistan provided another moment where some of these possibilities, you know, there was an attempt to explore some of these possibilities because once the Americans withdrew, uh, we had you know, India, Pakistan, China, the Central Asian countries, all of them, Russia, all of them in a very similar bind on what to do there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were some attempts at engagement here and there, although it not really sort of uh, take off as much as many observers had hoped because they had hoped for a new regional sort of uh, alliance, not alliance per se, no regional engagement on with Afghanistan in this issue. But the key question, yeah, if you ask about uh, what might happen right now, I think it's a, bit too uh, early to say because on the one hand it is clear that india is committed to the quad there's no denying that and you know whenever the quad has talked about uh, the indo-pacific for instance india has very much been on board they're very happy to uh, you know take be part of all those uh, pr- pronouncements and declarations so to speak so they, we're not seeing any reduction in those kind of te- temperatures at all so uh, this issue is kind so i would say that a large part of this really depends on what happens with regard to the war itself in the coming uh, months and maybe even years, because uh, many people, experts have talked about the possibility of decoupling, right? In the sense that are we seeing the possibility of Russia and China sort of consciously taking an effort to say decouple themselves from uh, the Western bloc as much as possible, in which case countries like India have a huge choice to make because they really can't, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a very difficult ch- choice for them, in which case we might see further engagement with China on some of these issues. On the other hand, if this is, uh, you know, not going to perhaps take, uh, say, if that decoupling does not take place to that extent, if it's uh, in some senses, if it is resolved relatively faster, we might see India going back much more quickly and easily to some of its earlier positions as far as China is concerned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, one other issue I'm, I'm curious about is, if there is uh, the climate of, of Russophobia at all or to any degree like this, I mean, as you know very well, Prasant, obviously the overhang from the Cold War, it's like, you know, anti-Russia, everything is so easy to do. But, you know, I notice when I look even at like mainstream media in India, I'll see reports on Donbass and things like that. So I'm curious, you know, what the climate is there, sort of the man on the street, person on the street, if you will, in terms of how they're kind of viewing this and, and the broader demonization around Russia. That's a very interesting question, Eugene, because uh, there have been some very strange bedfellows in recent times, so to speak, when it comes to uh, these issues. Because, for instance, on the one hand, a couple of things. First of all, especially under this government, foreign policy has been very, very closely associated with domestic policy. So, you know, there is the Indian government never loses a chance to portray anything related to what's happening abroad to its own achievements, so to speak, achievements. In fact, uh, there was a bit of a controversy over Indian students in Ukraine when the issue first broke out over the evacuation. Many experts did say that the Indian government was not quick enough. The Indian government, of course, had its own narrative. It was used during elections. People were, you know, people did hear about, oh, Narendra Modi did well in Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But keeping that aside, a uh, couple. So one interesting thing we do see is that even the right-wing media in India, which is a lot of the television media, the big channels, very very right-wing. They have actually taken you know, a far less pro-US position than uh, you would often expect in such situations. 
And even if you look at what is the centrist media, there is, a, a, you know, there are, there's a lot of talk about what are the strategic lessons India can learn from this kind of a situation. You know, how does how should India position itself between uh, these two uh, players? So uh, you you know you don't see as much as as much of the pro US uh, say uh, sort of rhetoric that you see in many other countries maybe on this issue. Part of this is of course due to the fact that India has a very long relationship with Russia, like I said, with the Soviet Union before and even with Russia. So there's a bit of you know memories of that, nostalgia of that, for instance, to some extent. Part of that is because many of these commentators are very clued in about the economic relationship and that it doesn't make sense to really sort of just jump into that bandwagon and say that anything, you know, you cancel out anybody or anything Russian. So that's part of it. And I think even if you look, for instance, at the, at the uh, broad number of people on the street, there is, of course, a lot of people who consume, uh, say, media from the West, especially media from the United States and the United Kingdom. So there is, the, you know, uh, there, there is a lot of that sentiment. I'm not going to deny that. But at the same time, I think that uh, that uh, narrative has not really sort of uh, been as successful, say, in a country like India. And I think it could be true of many countries in the global south as well. There is always a little bit more, uh, you know, while there is a lot of general admiration for the United States about many things, um, many of which might be truly unwarranted. But uh, nonetheless, the fact remains is that, uh, you know, in this matter, it's a bit, I, I don't think really the narrative has completely worked so much. People are a bit more inclined to say that, well, uh, you know, take a sort of realist, what is called a realist foreign position, foreign policy position in some senses, even when you have ordinary discussions, so to speak. And on, on that note, I'm, I'm curious, you know, given how there's so much of the world that does uh, that does import a lot of commodities from uh, Russia, particularly when it comes to fertilizer and uh, wheat oil and gas um is does india stand to be affected by the imposition of these sanctions by basically the entire west or is there a get around for india right so i think ultimately it boils down to uh, the question oil like i said is a key question the question of chemicals fertilizers all of these so there is the, the the possibility of a rise of prices inflation is already kind of rising in india so this is a very bad time for you know, these kind of issues as far as this government is concerned. We have an election coming up in 2024. So uh, general discontent is the last thing uh, the government right now wants to sort of deal with. So I think as far as the Indian government is concerned, they're going to be trying to do everything possible to sort of see how, how many waivers they can get on uh, this issue as far as it's concerned. But just because you pointed out that, out that Rani, I just want to also add that some one of the things uh, you know especially news click we have been sort of writing about is the fact that for many countries like india this is a larger existential question as well in terms of what do you do when your dollar reserves are so vulnerable to being expropriated to being seized at any point of time you know it was you know you could always sort of uh, say earlier say that, okay these are small countries like iran or venezuela and sort of uh, say pretend you know say for many indians or indian policymakers pretend they didn't exist Iran was bad enough, but when it comes to Russia now, it's now it's a larger question that, you know, what happens, say, five or seven years down the line, where uh, can you be affected by these sanctions? It's, uh, can India be affected by these sanctions itself? And I think these are questions that many people, many more people are beginning to ask. Now, it's the, uh, there are two, there are, there's really a fork on the road. There are two real ways you can go from here. One is to sort of decide that, all right, you should sort of, you know, start thinking of alternative infrastructures, start working with other uh, countries who are providing or position to provide these alternative infrastructures and for that reason try to resolve some of the geopolitical issues that you're facing right now because India has is in a very bad position in terms of its neighborhood on the other hand you can equally decide that the simplest thing is just to completely tow the US line if not now in a couple of years and then be safe, so to speak, from <laughs> sanctions whatever pain it might bring so that way I guess this crisis is a big, uh, you know, it's a big question for uh, Indian policymakers because you know they're such a large player, and with uh, so much of so so much of imports, especially in terms of raw materials, uh, these these are really the big challenges right now. Mm -hmm. Well, Prasant, as always, really appreciate you being willing to join us. I think People's Dispatch is covering this from so many angles, and News Click doing a fantastic job covering all things happening there on the subcontinent. So thank you so much for giving us some of your time here in the Freedom Side. Thank you so much, Eugene Radio.